performing George and Ira Gershwin's Love is Here to Stay in honor of Dr. Billington and his creation of the Library of Congress Gershwin Prize for Popular Song.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden. Good morning. Good morning. It is my honor to welcome all of you here today as we celebrate the career and the life of the 13th Librarian of Congress, Dr. James Billington. To Dr. Billington's wife, Marjorie, and their children and grandchildren and family members, our hearts and thoughts are with you. And we are so honored that you are with us today. To the members of Congress, led by Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, to our colleagues from the Woodrow Wilson Center, led by their President and CEO, Jane Harmon, to Library of Congress staff and retirees and guests, we are pleased to have all of you here on this very special day. As you know, Dr. Billington has left an indelible legacy on this institution that he led passionately and with honor for 28 years. With his vigor for philanthropy and tireless efforts to expand the reach and the impact of the Library of Congress, he achieved so much to advance the library as an enduring place for scholars and learners. The library is one of the greatest gifts and legacies the United States Congress has given to the American people and the vision of a national library to serve members of Congress and the communities they represent was a mission Dr. Billington wholeheartedly believed in. He often talked of getting the champagne out of the bottle, and he made significant progress and paved the way for the library as it is today and what it will be in the future. Dr. Billington has always been so gracious and welcoming to me through the years, and librarians and scholars coast to coast looked up to him as a mentor and a champion for academics and learning. I was honored to have him here when I was sworn in as his predecessor more than two years ago, and I was touched and will always be grateful for his decency and respect. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Mitch McConnell, Senate Majority Leader. Good morning, everyone. Our American Republic was built on ideas. It wasn't built on one ethnicity or on centuries of shared experience on the same land but on revolutionary ideas like liberty under law, equality before the law, and government by consent of the governed. Our founding fathers literally read their way to principles and ideas that built our nation. Before they were statesmen, they were students, students of history, philosophy, and politics, of literature and poetry as well. They prove what President Truman would later remark, not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are readers. And so it makes perfect sense that the institution we've inherited from the framers would include a Library of Congress, a universal national library, and in particular, one that's tied to the legislative branch where elected representatives make the people's voice heard. In its history, our nation has seen 14 librarians of Congress, different backgrounds, diverse interests, different passions, priorities, and of course, points of view. When he arrived in the job, Jim Billington wasn't even a librarian at all. For nearly 30 years, this Princeton valedictorian, Harvard professor, Rhodes Scholar, expert criminologist, and army veteran stewarded this hallowed institution and its treasures. This scholar and public intellectual proved to be an excellent leader. He helped this unique institution thrive and grow. He shepherded it into the internet age. So this morning we pay tribute to the achievements of a man who grew the world's largest library, who shepherded it 
into the internet age and open the rich annals of human history and imagination to new readers. Our country was blessed by his scholarship and public service. When Thomas Jefferson helped <clears throat> fill these shelves with the contents of his own personal library, I doubt he could have even imagined the collections that would one day join his beloved volumes right here. Photographs of our nation's darkest days during the American Civil War, films of an American walking on the moon. Maybe most shocking to Jefferson would be the staggering archive of nearly 200 billion tweets Only half of which are Donald Trump. <laughs> that was not in my script. <clears throat> <laughs> Dr. Billington's thoughtful embrace of a changing world helped this library maintain its crucial role in recording the past, contributing to the present, and brightening the future. He enthusiastically drove the development of various collections at the average pace of 12,000 new items a day. He preserved underappreciated works, giving voice to those who might otherwise have been forgotten to history. Today, more than 160 million items sit on shelves and on a growing number of computer servers because of Dr. Billington's dedication to expanding our national memory. And thanks to his commitment to broadening access, the two million visitors who visit this magnificent library each year can literally soak in the intellectual tradition of their nation. So look, I'm honored to be here for this celebration of Dr. Billington's life and his dedicated service to our republic. His legacy of scholarship of creativity and of fine stewardship was a great gift and it will benefit generations to come. Thank you very much. Please welcome the Director, President and CEO of Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars the Honorable Jane Harmon. Good morning. How fitting it is to have an overflow crowd and the majority leader of the United States Center, Senate, plus uh, my dear friend Carla Hayden, the Billington family, and my former colleagues from Congress here this morning to celebrate Jim Billington, an intellectual giant and a lovely man. He was my predecessor a few ago as president and CEO of the Wilson Center and put our scholar program on the map. Under Jim's leadership from 1973 to 1987, the center also created its award-winning Wilson Quarterly Magazine, and established several, several of our oldest programs, including the Kennan Institute on Russia, Ukraine, and the region, the Latin America program, and the Asia program. It is a really cool thing that George Kennan, viewed as the greatest diplomat in US history, was actually in residence at the center from 1974 to 1975, and that the program was named after his ancestor, George Kennan, quote, the elder, arguably the nation's first ever Russia expert. Kennan the Younger was a forerunner of the countless Wilson Center scholars today who research and write extraordinary books. In fact, several of our scholars and alumni have won Pulitzer Prizes in the past few years, including John Lewis Gaddis for his biography of George Kennan. In 1987, Jim moved from the center to the Library of Congress, as you have heard. Uh, my friend Carla Hayden has welcomed you here, and there will be more to describe his legacy here in addition to what Mitch McConnell just said. But for us, 
We were thrilled when after Jim left the library, he came back. And in his last several years, we at the Wilson Center were able to enjoy his brilliance and his friendship again. My colleague, Matt Rajansky, will talk about Jim and Russia, but I want to talk for a minute about Jim, his wife Margie, and their family. My late husband, Sidney Harmon, and I were so lucky to know the Billingtons, to have dinners with them, and in my case, to get a guided tour of the Kremlin from Jim. It doesn't get better than that. The close-knit family that Jim lives be leaves behind will do everything possible to honor his memory and so will the Wilson Center, where he leaves another stunning legacy. I last saw him resplendent in black tie at a dinner hosted by the Cannon Institute just weeks before he died. He was so handsome, he was vigorous, and he was celebrated as the inspiration for so much that the center has accomplished. That won't change, I promise. Jim and Margie knew that Sidney Harmon loved quoting poetry. And these lines, which he often quoted from Alfred Lord Tennyson's Ulysses, seem to fit the moment. Though much is taken, much abides. And we, though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Jim never yielded. We can all take inspiration from that. One of the greatest privileges, the greatest friendships that I've made in my life is with Jim Billington. A visionary and widely respected leader, Dr. Billington expanded the scope and reach of the institutions he served, setting the highest standards for his colleagues and himself. A forceful yet compassionate person, he enlisted support and made many friendships as he steadily pursued his goals. As a fundraiser, particularly at the Library of Congress, he was unexcelled. As an innovator, he created new and lasting programs on an international scale. At the Wilson Center in 1974, he co-founded the Kennan Institute for Advanced Russian Studies and established the Wilson Quarterly. In Paris in 2009, he announced the launch of the World Digital Library an international collaborative effort with support from UNESCO and others. I, James H. Billington. I, James H. Billington. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. James H. Billington was nominated to serve as Librarian of Congress by President Ronald Reagan in 1987 and unanimously approved by the U.S. Senate. For this place, like the great country it serves, has a destiny to be a living encyclopedia of democracy, not just a mausoleum for culture, but a catalyst for civilization. Thank you very much. The creation of the James Madison Council, the institution's first private sector support group, occurred in 1990. Its establishment was a key to many of his achievements particularly in supporting new digital and educational initiatives. Private support was an integral part of an unparalleled new scholarly program, the John W. Kluge Center, and its prize for achievement in the study of humanity. The equally unparalleled Packard National Audiovisual Center in Culpeper, Virginia, was the result of the largest private sector gift in the library's history. 
two of the many examples of major Billington-era acquisitions acquired in part with private support are the Marion S. Carson Collection of Americana, which Dr. Billington himself called the most significant acquisition of Americana by the Library of Congress in this century, and the only known copy of the 1507 world map by Martin Walzemuller which contains the first use of the word America as a designation for a portion of the New World. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Book Festival. What I felt good about was that this was a fun event. It was like a kind of mini World's Fair. The establishment of the National Book Festival is another landmark in the Billington legacy, helping the Library of Congress achieve what he, in his inaugural talk in 1987, saw as its destiny. After 28 years of service at this amazing institution, I am announcing my retirement, which will take effect January 1st, 2016. So, Jim, I express the gratitude that so many of us feel in our hearts as well as our minds for how you have served our country and, met and enlarged the reach and the scope and the appeal of this great American institution, the Library of Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Hayden, Jane Harmon, my former colleague, and the Billington family. Marjorie and the children, I'll acknowledge in a moment. Thank you, Dr. Hayden, for bringing us all together today. Thank you, Jane Harmon and the Wilson Center for your leadership, and again, uh, bringing us together uh, to honor Dr. Billington. On behalf of the U.S. House of Representatives, Dr. Billington's many friends there, uh, and all of the members, many of whom are here today, it is an honor to bring you greetings condolences and appreciation for the Honorable Dr. Billington, our friend. I feel especially close to Dr. Billington. It's appropriate uh, that we're here under the auspices of the Wilson Center uh, because I got to know him in another way. And Marjorie, I bring Paul's uh, sympathies to you as well. My husband was the chairman of the board of the Foreign Service School, and Dr. Billington was on the board. And I tell you that as a departure for my remarks because Dr. Billington would honor us at the, the dinners before the meetings uh, with his presentation on what was happening in the world, uh, largely telling us his view on Russia. And in the course of uh, his presentation, you'd think, Did I, can you hear him? He would slip into another language. Sometimes we didn't even know what language it was. <laughs> Mostly it would be Russian. Uh, but he had such enormous perspective and such values to make judgments about uh, what he was presenting to us. He was always eloquent, always erudite, always respected. And I say that just uh, from all those wonderful dinners with him at the Foreign Service School. Now you're here, we recognize him as a gifted academic and public servant who blessed, truly blessed our nation with his exceptional intelligence and dedicated stewardship of American history. Over his long and prolific career, he ensured that the treasures of American history in his care were preserved for generations to come. He knew about the past, he always cared about the future whether teaching students, collaborating with experts or scholars, or being a trusted advisor to 
many members of Congress and beyond, Dr. Billington's life and legacy left an indelible mark on our nation. Thanks to Dr. Billington, the Library of Congress remains a vibrant and vital institution. Under his leadership, as many of you know, uh, the library doubled the size of its collection to nearly 170 million items and expanded its reach to ensure that it could meet the needs of the American people now and into the future. I just remember him so clearly showing me how the technology was making so much of this accessible to people who were nowhere near Washington, D.C., uh, but cared deeply about knowledge. Dr. Billingsheim saw the Library of Congress as a, did not see it as a passive mausoleum of ancient history, but of an active catalyst for civilization, for civilization. He led the library, its mission, its mission to encourage young Americans to discover the love of learning by investing in groundbreaking educational initiatives. He pioneered, and that means we're going into technology, right? He pioneered the library's vast electronic collections, ensuring that the whole wisdom of humanity was available online to students, educators, researchers, and every American. In creating uh, congress.gov, he helped shine a light on the legislative process. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and engage the American people in our great democratic experiment. For Dr. Billington, the library was a sacred place of both knowledge and creativity. By establishing the Gershwin Prize for popular song, he sought to honor the legendary musicians who enrich our lives and strengthen our diverse artistic heritage. We often spoke about how the arts could bring us together for all of the history that shows how we had our differences, how we came together, how the arts, uh, the poet Shelley once wrote, the, the, um, the greatest force for moral good is imagination. Imagination to be creative, to imagine a better future. Imagination to put yourself in other people's position, to understand their point of view, uh, to resolve conflict. So the arts, he, with all of the knowledge, with all the wisdom, with all the history, it was also about how uh, we use all of that in the most creative way uh, for the betterment of the American people. So uh, he strengthens our diverse, our diverse uh, cultural heritage. Now with Dr. Hayden's vision and expertise, we're building on Dr. Billington's towering legacy to ensure that all Americans can see, experience, and learn from the history and knowledge he passionately protected and promoted. Uh, he would be very proud of, of what the library is doing now. Uh, I do think that what he did as a foundation enabled so much, so many good things to happen now, and he would want it that way. His unwavering commitment to empowering, educating, and serving the American people will continue to inspire all of us in this critical work. Uh, may it be a comfort to Marjorie and the entire Billington family uh, that so many continue uh, to mourn your loss of this great man and to uh, and pray for you at this sad time. And I extend the uh, gratitude to not only to Marjorie, but to Susan, James, and Thomas, to your beautiful grandchildren, which he was very proud, and so many dear family friends. Uh, with us, the loss of Dr. Billington is not only official, it's very personal. Thank you, Marjorie, for sharing him with us. And thank you, Marjorie, for your leadership as well as a true partner to Dr. Billington in all of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Please welcome the director of the Kennan Institute at Wilson Center, Matthew Rojanski. Good morning. Uh, you know, when I reflect on the impact that Jim Billington had on my life, uh, of course, I think first about his scholarship on Russia, uh, 
there from the very beginning of my education as a historian of Russia, today a practitioner in U.S.-Russian relations, his leadership, of course, in founding the Kennan Institute, his leadership of this library where I've been a researcher, his involvement in second-track diplomacy and trying to improve U.S.-Russia relations. Uh, and then I realized in watching the video that a photo I have from the National Book Festival with my then two-year-old daughter sitting on my shoulders and Sesame characters in the background is also thanks to Dr. Billington. So <laughs> those are some pretty great bookends. One of the first things I did when I was the newly minted director of the Kennan Institute six years ago was to pay a visit to our institute's co-founder, Dr. Billington, then in his office in the Madison Building of the Library of Congress. And I'll never forget his incredible generosity with me of his time, his advice, his goodwill and support. Uh, and I'll never forget the view from that office. Dr. Hayden, I hope you're enjoying that. Um, we, of course, talked about the founding of the Kennan Institute and the vision that he shared with the Institute's co-founders, Ambassador George F. Kennan himself uh, and Dr. Fred Starr, our first director. The vision being that scholarship of Russia, knowledge of Russia's history, knowledge of its culture, had to be at the heart of the Institute and at the heart of the U.S. approach to Russia. That focus was, of course, the heart of Dr. Billington's career as well. Many in the Russian studies field know and will forever remember Dr. Billington through his book, The Icon and the Axe, a seminal work. Half a century after its first publication, it is still the best history of Russian culture in the English language, and I think arguably in any language. But that's just the start. In the 1970s, he came to lead the Wilson Center on the explicit condition of establishing a national center for advanced research on Russia. He did that, and around 45 years later, the Kennan Institute now has thousands of alumni around the world. Chances are, if you study Russia in this country, you will learn from a professor who has been a fellow at the Kennan Institute. That was just the next step. Next came his 28-year tenure as Librarian of Congress. In addition to everything else he accomplished, which we'll hear about more during today's program, he did even more to advance this country's understanding of and capacity to engage with Russia. Already a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences himself, he established vital connections between American and Russian institutions of higher learning. He helped to promote wider public understanding of Russia with his 1988 television series, Face of Russia. He led multiple congressional delegations to Russia and was a key advisor to President Reagan about Russian history and culture. And he established the Open World Leadership Center here at the library, a program that has enabled more than 27,000 current and future leaders from the post-Soviet region to travel to America. So in looking back at the legacy of Jim Billington and his contributions to the world of academics and policy, I'd offer this observation. George Kennan may be famous as the author of containment, but Jim Billington should be remembered as the author of engagement with Russia. That legacy of engagement, of scholarship, of helping our nation to understand Russia, that's a legacy that we at the Kennan Institute strive to live up to every single day. And we do this for a reason that's central to our national interest. As Jim concluded in his book, Russia in Search of Itself, Young Russians still see the United States as the most successful and relevant example of what they hope to create in Russia. An inventive economy, an open society, and a more accountable government for a multi-ethnic, continent-wide nation. This aspiration gives Americans the opportunity, if not the obligation, to work more closely with and for the related processes of cultural self-discovery and economic and political transformation in Russia. Jim Billington's life that we celebrate today and his life's work that we honor and remember was indeed about Russia's past, but also was profoundly important to our own American future. Thank you. I first met Jim more than a dozen years ago when I got involved with the Library of Congress through the Madison Council, the support arm of the Library of Congress. Jim started that a number of years earlier, and it really enabled the Library of Congress to have a support arm that could provide funding for its important projects, projects that Congress really itself could not fund. Through that effort, I became close to Jim and worked with him, so I became the chairman of the Madison Council. And in those years that I became involved with the Madison Council and worked with it, I saw that Jim was a man of extraordinary intellect, 
a man of incredible dedication to the Library of Congress and a, quite a patriot, a greater patriot than perhaps anybody I've ever met. In the years that I got involved with the Library of Congress beyond the Madison Council, I worked with Jim on a number of other projects. One was the National Book Festival. That was something that he and Laura Bush started in 2001, and I was fortunate and privileged to get involved with it and to help make the National Book Festival as good a project as Jim could possibly envision it to be. I worked very hard with Jim, but every time that I did anything, it was Jim who really took the lead, Jim really had the ideas, and Jim really had the moral leadership to make certain that everybody in our country could participate in the National Book Festival if they wanted to do so. I'm very pleased as well to have been able to work with Jim on another project, the Congressional Dialogues. That's a project in which we have an opportunity to meet the greatest historians in the United States and talk to them about American history. And we do it principally in front of members of Congress. So more or less once a month when Congress is in session, we've been doing this, and I think it really has done a great job to help educate members of Congress about American history, but also to show the great resources and strengths of the Library of Congress. And I think members of Congress recognize, even more than they did before, what a great national treasure the Library of Congress is. All these things put together have made me realize that Jim Billington was an extraordinary individual, one of the most extraordinary people I've ever had the privilege to meet. He was a great scholar. He was a great librarian of Congress. He was a great American. He was a great patriot. And he was a great family man. And I really spent a lot of time talking to him about many of these subjects over the years. Nothing was more important to him than his family. And I very much enjoy the privilege to know his children and his wife, Marge. And I really regret very much that I can't be there today. But I, th I think all of you know, Jim Billington was a very close friend of mine, somebody that I really was privileged to know. And I very much regret that we no longer have him with us. Please welcome Senior Advisor to the Librarian of Congress, Ms. Marie Aranya. Good morning. Mrs. Billington, Billington family, Dr. Hayden, thank you for this opportunity to say a few words about my friend and mentor, James Hadley Billington. I had the very good fortune to meet Dr. Billington when I was editor-in-chief of Book World at the Washington Post. It was July 2001. The Post was hoping to launch the Washington Post's very own National Book Festival. And I was traveling the country, visiting every major festival I could in order to get a general idea of what was out there and what might be done. The Post was galvanized, obsessed, driven. It intended to build the biggest, smartest, happiest book festival in the country. And it had the total support of its chairman, himself a voracious reader and book lover, Don Graham. I can't remember whether it was Chicago or Los Angeles or Miami at the time where I was, but quite unexpectedly, I got a phone call from someone on my staff saying the Library of Congress and the White House had just called a press conference, and I should probably listen up. <laughs> and indeed, well, there it was. I was suddenly seeing Dr. Billington on C-SPAN, beamed from these very halls, announcing the Library of Congress National Book Festival, a collaboration with First Lady Laura Bush, the inauguration of which would unfold on the National Mall just five weeks later, on September 8, 2001. Of course, as you can well imagine, that was the end of that. <laughs> there was no other possible book festival in Washington. You could just hear the wind rush out of the post's big, ambitious festival bubble. I rode an airplane home on it. When I got back to Washington, I called Dr. Billington, introduced myself, and told him that the Post couldn't possibly compete with two Washington institutions as mighty as the Library of Congress and the First Lady of the United States. All the same, we wanted to join the effort and support it wholeheartedly and in every way possible. 
I cannot live without books, Dr. Billington said at the opening announcement on July 30, 2001, quoting Thomas Jefferson. He had gone on to say that no one should have to live without books, a big, free, public event throwing a very bright light on the joys and importance of reading was just the thing for a nation built, as James Madison had once said, and as Dr. Billington now reminded us, on liberty and learning. Liberty and learning were clear, defining, quintessentially American aspirations, and they leaned on each other for mutual support. One could not live without the other. A book festival that brought together writers and readers, wisdom and curiosity, might just remind us and our children how crucial knowledge is to a living, breathing democracy. Needless to say, the Post couldn't have agreed with him more. Dr. Billington immediately welcomed the newspaper to the task, as did Mrs. Bush, and that began a happy collaboration that has lasted these 19 years. And how could anyone resist such a call to duty? Build it was essentially what the Post and the public said, and the people will come, and, and they came. Thanks to the dedicated staff of the library, Dr. Billington and Mrs. Bush's initiative is now the largest, most distinguished public book event in the country. And by now, millions of people have come. Eight years later, in 2009, I decided to leave the post to write my own books. I had written and published five while juggling a full-time job as a managing editor and literary critic. And I decided that what I really wanted more than anything now was to throw myself into scholarship that most interested me, the history of Latin America, how it has made Hispanics who we are. It was then that Carolyn Brown, the director of the Kluge Center at the time, with Dr. Billington's blessing, invited me to come to Kluge as a vis visiting scholar to write my biography of Simon Bolivar, the Latin American liberator and founder. Burrowing into the library's incomparable stores of Latin American history, I began to understand the passion that James Billington brought to this library's vast collection and to the groundbreaking scholarship that emerges from it. Dr. Billington's unwavering aim throughout his tenure as librarian was to expose scholars to the extraordinary holdings, the unmatched resources that are housed here he understood that the collection that this library has cultivated and curated so carefully, so thoroughly, over more than 200 years, nurtures something greater than itself. It represents our lasting heritage as Americans, as citizens of the world. That bank of accumulated human wisdom catalyzes thinking, ignites the imagination, it disseminates truths. It feeds the national discussion. Ultimately, it spurs parents and teachers to raise American children to a higher standard. If we do things right, Dr. Billington said, the American public and the wider world will marvel at the resources it holds here under this institution's many roofs. That is the miracle of the Library of Congress, the largest cultural institution on the planet. It is that essential core of knowledge and what it represents that constitutes our greatest legacy. Scholarship, as I quickly learned, the very reason I had left my life at the Post was at the heart and soul of Dr. Billington. You could see his eyes light up when there was a big idea at work, a bright unexpected leap of the mind or the imagination, especially if it was grounded in a vein of knowledge that anyone might tap into at the Library of Congress. Connecting ordinary Americans to the thrills, the delights of intellectual discovery was his goal. As Dr. Hayden said, he often used to say, let's get the champagne out of the bottle. Let's build ways to pry the fireworks from those shelves and into people's hands. An abundance of ideas rooted in this library's resources was his life's objective. 
You could see it in the institutions and programs he established throughout his career, and you've heard about them all here. The John W. Kluge Center for Scholars, the Kluge Prize, the, Na the National Digital Library, the National Book Festival, the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction, the Hispanic Working Group, the Celebration of Mexico, the Gershwin Prize, the Young Reader Center, the Veterans History Project, a spate of Russian initiatives, the Living Legend Awards, the Madison Council, the National Registry of Recorded Sound, the opening of the National Audiovisual Center on the library's Packard campus in Culpeper, Virginia. In 2013, when I finished my book on Simon Bolivar, Dr. Billington invited me to take an office at his side. It was there during a brief period of a few years, working to expand the book festival, broaden the library's relationships with the global south, setting a firm objective to make the library more attractive as resource and employer to Hispanics like me, that I better understood the enthusiasms of his tenure. As bonus, I had something more. I had a spirited scholar, a dynamic teacher, and fervent American wandering into my office from time to time to sit down and simply shoot the breeze. <laughs> I've had much good fortune since. I've been lucky enough to continue my relationship with this library to work for Dr. Billington's inspiring and brilliant successor, Carla Hayden, and her ongoing mission to light a very bright life, light and fire on behalf of books, reading, children, education, scholarship, and the American engagement. It is truly a privilege to stand here and bear witness to it all. And I will always remain grateful, infinitely grateful, for the opportunity to have known and worked with one of the most accomplished, erudite, and visionary national librarians of our time, James Hadley Billington. Thank you very much. One of the most important acquisitions during Dr. Pillington's tenure as the Librarian of Congress was the 1507 World Map by Martin Waltzmuller. The 1507 map was a radical vision of the geography of the world discovered by Christopher Columbus and Amerigo Vespucci. The map itself was also the first to name America and has become known as the birth certificate of America. It was found in a portfolio owned by the Nuremberg astronomer Johann Schoner. The book itself um, is a monument um, to Dr. Billington's tenure here at the library, as it was one of the most important and one of the most expensive acquisitions ever at the Library of Congress. In the book itself, there is a book plate um, of Johann Schoner, which is a bit of a metaphor for Dr. Billington, in that the book plate itself says, saved for posterity by Johann Schoner. Is there any better way for a man to become a monument to the future? The 1507 map is no longer in the book, but is on dis permanent display in the Thomas Jefferson Building after it was turned over to the American people by Angela Merkel in a special ceremony. Dr. Billington also championed an ambitious project to document the contemporary American experience. Photographer Carol M. Highsmith uses digital cameras to take copyright-free images and make them available for free on the internet. This special collection in the Prints and Photographs Division at the Library of Congress contains thousands of photographs that are together forming a truly unique full-length portrait of the United States in the early 21st century. The Highsmith photographs depict structures and landscapes and also introduce Americans at work and at play. They are stunning and quirky they are poignant and humorous. And not only is the collection breathtaking and becoming more comprehensive, every one of the images is rights-free. What an amazing acquisition. Thank you, Carol Highsmith, and thank you, Dr. Billington. Dr. Billington paved the way for the acquisition of the Rosa Parks collection. He admired and enjoyed promoting the collection. It greatly enhanced our resources for the 20th century civil rights movement. This manuscript is a set of notes that Rosa Parks wrote reflecting on her refusal to give up her seat 
uh, on December the 1st, 1955, for which she was arrested. Rosa Parks begins the notes by describing the moment of her arrest. She says, I had been pushed around all of my life, and I felt at this moment I just couldn't take it anymore. When I asked the policeman why we had to be pushed around, he said he didn't know. The law was a law. You are under arrest. The notes crystallize Rosa Parks' bus protest, the defining moment of her life, and also her iconic status as the mother of the modern civil rights movement. I think I had been at the Library of Congress for maybe two or three months. I was called into Dr. Billington's office in 1998. Uh, plans were underway for the Library of Congress Bicentennial, very big plans. In fact, one of the great legacies of Dr. Billington is, in fact, the bicentennial celebration at the Library of Congress. It made sense at the time, uh, looking for suggestions as to how to celebrate the bicentennial, for us to suggest that we reconstruct Thomas Jefferson's book collection as it had been purchased by the American people in 1815 following the disastrous fires of the War of 1814. Uh, the reason we needed to reconstruct Jefferson's book collection was because of another disastrous fire in the Capitol in 1851 on Christmas Eve uh, when a chimney flue fire caused uh, the destruction of two-thirds of the holdings of the Capitol's collection, which was then called the Congressional Library. In that fire, two-thirds of Thomas Jefferson's original books that had been purchased in 1815 were destroyed. So the proposal that was up for discussion with Dr. Billington was could we fund a project that would allow us to go out and recover exactly matching editions of all the books that had been lost in the fire in 1851 so that we could reconstruct for the American people the experience of seeing Thomas Jefferson's book collection as it had been received in 1815. Uh, at, at the heart is the spirit of Dr. Billington's understanding of the Library of Congress and its place in terms of the minds and hearts of the American people. And today it stands as a permanent exhibition uh, one of the great opportunities for the American people to see not only the beginning of the Library of Congress, but to see 6,487 volumes as collected by Thomas Jefferson, and that's part of the Billington legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Greg Harper, former chairman of the Joint Committee on the Library. Thank you, Dr. Hayden, for allowing us to have this incredible moment uh, to remember our friend. Now, I want you to know that Dr. Billington did not invent the internet. He was the internet. He was the smartest person I've ever known, and spending time with him taught me to be a better lifetime student, a learner, and a reader. He taught me how to be a better person, even though he never knew he was doing that. My regular meetings with Dr. Billington almost always took place in his office. He wanted to come to see me, but I always insisted, no, I'll come to your office. He thought I was just being nice. But where else can you look out of a window and see the Library of Congress and the Capitol at the same time? And I always position myself where I could look out the window, as, as Dr. Hayden knows uh, that deal. Those meetings were a treasure trove of information. I, I asked lots of questions. But we all know this. Dr. Billington never gave short answers. <laughs> so... Sometimes my, I got one question in, uh, and it just soaked it in and listened to him speak with such passion and love of life and, and kindness towards others. He was helpful to a fault. I remember in the summer of 2013 when we were planning a trip to go see our daughter in France uh, who was there for a six-month internship. He said, I uh, uh, wish you could go see the uh, Lafayette's castle. And he said, but it's not open to the public. And I said, well, is there any way you can think of we might could get in? He said, well, I'm on the board. 
And because of his work there at Lafayette's family castle, we have, as a part of the collection here, digital copies of everything in Lafayette's uh, castle that otherwise would not be available. So needless to say, we had an amazing tour of that castle. In the almost 10 years that I knew him, I never once heard him say an unkind word about anyone. When I observed him being criticized, and in my opinion, unfairly criticized, he never retaliated in any way. He never responded with anger or bitterness, but with the grace and dignity that defined him and the confidence of someone who trusted the Lord and as someone who always knew that he had done the best job to the best of his ability. He had done his job and done it with excellence. And he never took credit for those many successes. He always gave the shout out and the credit to the great team that he had put around him here. When I attended his funeral last year, it was virtually, a, it was a who's who list from all over the world, the people that came to pay their respects. Most important to me, Dr. Billington taught me to be a, a better husband. As I watched the love and gentleness, gentleness that he displayed towards the love of his life, Marjorie. Didn't you just love to watch them together? Marjorie, no spouse has ever been loved like you were. You were truly devoted to one another, and your marriage was and always will be the most special love story I've ever witnessed. God bless you, Mrs. Billington, and God bless each of you in the Billington family. Thank you. I'm sorry that I can't be with you today to remember and celebrate the life of Dr. James H. Billington. His love of poetry, his deep and abiding knowledge of it, was not only a gift to me, but an inspiration. He was our foremost champion of poetry. I remember the first time I visited his office after he'd appointed me Poet Laureate. That was in 2012. And that day, he was reflecting on two things. The Morrill Act, enacted 150 years before, during the Civil War, to create land-grant colleges in the US, making a way for public higher education in the nation. He was also thinking about epic poetry, the role of epic poetry in American life, the need to tell our stories of the extraordinary women and men who gave shape to our nation, our moral universe. These two things, the moral act and epic poetry, were, for him, connected. There is, for me, another connection. Years later, I remember telling him about television programs I'd seen, a series of made-for-TV movies called The Librarian. This was not great storytelling, but for all the camp, I still love the premise of these shows. The main character was the head of an institution that housed not only books, but also a collection of antiquities. A scholar, he was chosen to be the guardian of all things important to our national history, our cultural memory. His great intelligence gave him near supernatural powers, and in everything he did, there was always something important at stake. That's who Dr. Billington was, a guardian of our most important national resource, our great cultural repository of knowledge, a champion of the truth that poetry insists upon, a man possessed by a deep and humane intelligence, nearly supernatural in his service to our nation, my hero. Please welcome distinguished senior fellow and William E. Simon Chair in Catholic Studies, Ethics and Public Policy Center, George Weigel. Good 
morning. Clement uh, Attlee once described Winston Churchill as something like a layer cake. One never knew, Attlee said, which layer of Churchill's personality would be on display at a given moment. The 17th century Churchill, imaginatively riding across the battlefields of Europe with his great ancestor Marlborough. The 18th century Churchill, standing in Parliament alongside Edmund Burke. Or the 19th century man born into the aristocracy at Blenheim Palace. Or the colossus of the democratic 20th century. Or even, at least said, the visionary of the 21st century. Jim Billington was similarly multi-layered in terms of accomplishment as we've been reminded today. To the rich array of his talents already described, I would add one from my experience of him at the Woodrow Wilson Center in 1984-1985. His singular and quite extraordinary ability to enter any conversation and ask the one penetrating question that got everyone thinking in a fresh way. No mean accomplishment among high-powered academics who may doubt the Pope's infallibility, but not their own. <laughs> in terms of character, though, I would highlight today what three and a half decades of friendship taught me was the deepest layer of Jim Billington, the layer that made all the other layers, the husband and father, the scholar, the public official, the diplomat, even the TV star, possible, and that made the man so compelling. Jim Billington was, at bottom, a Christian gentleman. Once familiar, that character type is all the more precious for being somewhat rare today. So at a moment when some in our public life cannot bring themselves to use the word Christian to describe those murdered in, the, in Sri Lankan churches on Easter, while others weaponize faith for partisan purposes, let us remember and be grateful for the example of Jim Billington, Christian gentleman a man in whom faith enlarged and amplified reason, while reason purified and deepened faith. With Pope St. John Paul II, Jim Billington knew, as John Paul put it, that faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. And in his gentlemanly Christian way, Jim Billington tried to help Washington understand that, both in his service at the Wilson Center and here at the Library of Congress. Secure in his basic Christian conviction, Jim Billington was a man of great books who knew that a book's greatness is based not on aspects of its author's identity, but on that author's ability to unveil deep truths about the human condition. And from the great books, Jim Billington learned and tried to help others learn that this civilizational enterprise we call the West, including the American democratic experiment, has roots that run far deeper than the Enlightenment, roots that reach back to Jerusalem, Athens, and Rome to biblical religion, its teaching about the dignity of the human person and its exodus-informed conviction that life is adventure and pilgrimage, not cyclical repetition or meaningless absurdity, roots that reach back to the ancient Greek conviction that reason can get at the truths that are built into the world and into us, roots that reach back to the Ciceronian conviction that the rule of law is superior to the rule of brute force. Inviting as many as possible into that great multifaceted civilizational conversation in as many venues as possible and through as many instruments as were available 
was Jim Billington's great strategy for the Library of Congress. It was a strategy and a personal commitment formed by both faith and reason. And the accomplishment we remember and honor today was the accomplishment of a Christian gentleman whose deepest convictions opened him up to serious conversation with everyone else. At a moment in our national history when convictions tend to create silos rather than robust and thoughtful debates, it is good to remember the example of a man of faith and reason whose convictions created genuine human encounters, real conversations that broke out of zero-sum gamesmanship to enlarge the understanding and thus ennoble the humanity of everyone involved. Thank you. Please welcome the Managing Director of U.S. Ministry, American Bible Society, Susan Billington Harper. Thank you. On behalf of my mother, Marjorie, my sister, Ann Fisher, who couldn't be here today, my brothers, Jim and Tom Billington, I want to thank Carla Hayden, John Cole, and the whole staff of the Library of Congress for organizing this beautiful, beautiful event and exhibition in honor of my father. We also want to thank Susan Carmel for her generous support and her friendship. We're really deeply, deeply grateful for how you've all honored our father's memory today. Dad just loved this institution, and he served it with all his heart for 28 years. Um, books and the people who wrote, read, and discussed them were always at the very center of his life. Dad's father never went to college due to financial hardship, so he educated himself by reading. He used, he used to joke that he got his degree at Leary's, which was Philadelphia's best used bookstore. <laughs> My father grew up in the Great Depression in a small house filled with books and with people who just loved to talk about them. The food was scarce in those years, but the conversations were rich. By high school, he learned Russian in order to read Tolstoy's War and Peace in the original so he could understand what enabled the Russian people to resist Hitler as they had Napoleon before him. He read Dostoevsky's novel, The Possessed, to better understand what he later described in his profound book, Fire in the Minds of Men, as the disorder of revolutionary utopianism, the desire for progress through destruction. He launched his lifelong romance with opera as a supernumerary spear carrier for Philadelphia and Philadelphia's productions of the Metropolitan Opera. A terrific public school education and full scholarships to both college and graduate school then enabled him to realize educational dreams that were denied his own father. So growing up, our house was also filled with books and we typically went to sleep to the sound of dad's typewriter as he was writing his own books. Our job as children, this was before the advent of personal computers, was to number and renumber the pages and footnotes of his manuscript drafts when he added or subtracted sections. <laughs> it was a big job. <laughs> Our family rarely traveled anywhere without unfinished manuscripts in tow. And one summer, we almost lost all of Fire in the Minds of Men in a stormy sea when we were disembarking from a small motorboat. Dad had the ability to write books virtually anywhere and in the most chaotic situations. 
He could set up his typewriter and then later his computer in the middle of a high traffic entryway or in a laundry room if he needed to. So you can just imagine how delighted he was when he started working in the Library of Congress's palatial surroundings. If dad were here today, I know he'd want me simply to say thanks. First to Marjorie, who made everything possible for him and for us as a family. Their 61 years of marriage began in Washington when dad was in the army and serving in Eisenhower's Office of National Estimates and mom was working for Delaware Senator Alan Freer. She supported him through professorships at Harvard and Princeton and then through 45 years of collective service to the Board of Foreign Scholarships, the Woodrow Wilson Center, the Library of Congress, and Open World. I know that dad would want to start by thanking you, mom. Dad would want me to say thanks to each and every one of his colleagues and friends gathered here today. When Dad received the Jack Kemp Foundation Award in 2014, he said, almost everything that I or any individual public servant can be said to have accomplished is really only the sum total of gifts that God has given us and that other people have affected within us. So now, in this short film, I'll let Dad have the last word regarding how very, very much he appreciated the many wonderful people he was blessed to know and work with all his life. Thank you for being here. This was in, I guess, the, um, uh, the late 60s. We had been to Russia as a family uh, on an exchange with the Academy of Sciences. And I'd seen a lot of Russian operas there. We were living like Russians and having a really quite wonderful time. The best thing you can do is something that we've, uh, we've never really done. And that is to understand the people of the country, to better understand them by not only what they've written, but what they've created, what they've done themselves. To better understand that, you have to think beyond just what's the headline of today and to what's the prospect that tomorrow can still be better than yesterday. Ambassador Kennan and Dr. Billington were leading voices in a circle of Washington wise men. Individuals celebrated and consulted by the high and mighty for their deep knowledge and sound judgment. Now, Dr. Billington still embodies those very traits, and I believe those are traits in which we are of in very great need at this moment. One of the great virtues in writing a memoir is that when you're editing it, you can take out the first person singular because what you really have to talk about is the amazing people in your life that you didn't do enough to keep up with, but you can at least make some amends by talking about them and talking about only positive things when you get around to writing a memoir. History is about people. It's not about big data, about anything else. It's about people, and it's the stories they tell you because they get inside you and affect you. That's a fact. Whereas the headlines and the things you encounter in your own narrow life at the beginning, what stays with you is only what affects you and gets inside you and comes out and helps shape you. So it's tentative answers to important questions and the important questions you can only really get inside you if you realize that history is about people, not about abstract theories or about abstract concepts or ways of talking about it, but it's about extending yourself into the lives of others.
the Librarian of Congress. Thank you to the Verona String Quartet for a beautiful, beautiful performance with the library Stradivarius violins. This has been a wonderful and special day celebrating the life and the legacy of Dr. Billington. And it continues on the first floor in Mahogany Row. Library of Congress curators have created a beautiful display of the amazing treasures and collections Dr. Billington was able to acquire for the library. And these items are for all of you and the public to see. Library staff are here to direct you to the display. Thank you again for coming today and being a part of this celebration of the life and legacy of Dr. Billington. We appreciate your support in remembering him and we extend our deepest appreciation and gratitude to Mrs. Billington and his family.